We're going to get going this morning. Uh, I'm Mayor Chris Coleman, and I am very, very glad to be here today to uh, both recognize a, a National Domestic Abuse Awareness Month and talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in the city of St. Paul that I do believe are making a fundamental difference to make women and children in this community safer, uh, responding to a very, very significant criminal justice crisis in the city of St. Paul, uh, and really working with a wide variety of community groups and law enforcement agencies to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to reduce the, uh, the, the very devastating violence uh, associated with uh, domestic abuse, and uh, I think we're making some very significant progress. Uh, we are, first and foremost, vigorously prosecuting domestic violence cases in the city of St. Paul. We are going after the perpetrators, and we are doing everything that we can to make sure that the uh, violence doesn't escalate and that the very risk that uh, women and children find themselves at uh, all too often in this community is reduced. We don't have to look too far back to realize why this is important. Only a couple of weeks ago, a woman and two children were murdered in Badness Heights. Every time you hear one of those stories, it sickens you because you know that that wasn't the first instance of violence. You know that that wasn't the first opportunity for intervention. We certainly know in that particular case, there were multiple previous abuses, multiple opportunities where perhaps we could have changed the outcome for that family. We have in the city of St. Paul some incredible leadership on this issue. In this room, we have former St. Paul City Attorney John Choi, who in his tenure as city attorney did an amazing job of bringing the community together to help resolve some of those issues. Uh, former Chief Harrington is not here, but he was instrumental in the development of the Blueprint for Safety, and I would like to just recognize him. Along with that, we have our current chief, Tom Smith, who has continued the work of John Harrington, uh, has continued to make this a priority of the St. Paul Police Department. We have our new city attorney, Sarah Gruing, uh, who from uh, one of the reasons why I chose to make Sarah my city attorney was that knowing her through her work as my chief of staff, I knew that domestic violence and the prosecution of domestic violence would be a priority of hers. Bree Adams Brill is a victim advocate at the St. Paul Domestic Abuse Intervention Project and works with victims of these crimes on a daily basis. We also have an amazing young woman, a survivor. Kelly is a person who was a victim of very violent and horrifying attacks by someone that she thought she cared for and she thought cared for her. She's gonna share her story with us this morning and I think it's a real act of bravery for her to be here and we're so thankful that she'll be with us. Kelly's story, which she'll share with you later, really brings home the reason why we're gathered here today. Really brings home all the messages, all the things that we've talked about. We know we have to do something about this crime of domestic violence. One of every four females will experience some form of domestic violence in their life. If a woman tries to remove herself from an abusive situation, her risk of being murdered is increased by 75%. A third of all homicide victims are victims, are victims of a domestic abuse situation. In the city of St. Paul, there are 12,000 domestic abuse calls to 911 each year. That's one of the reasons why we have worked so hard to create a collaboration, to look at a, uh, this problem from a fresh approach and to see what all uh, partners can bring to the table to help end this. We drama drama dramatically and drastically increased the number of people we have convicted for domestic abuse as a result of our efforts. Particularly, this is true in the gone on arrival cases. All too often, a perpetrator will flee before the police are able to get out there to resolve a situation. But because of aggressive law enforcement approach to this issue, we have been able to charge those gone on arrival cases, we've been able to get convictions, and we've been able to hopefully start breaking the cycle of domestic abuse. Our partners in this effort are the St. Paul Blueprint for Safety, as I mentioned earlier, the Flare Up Project, and Bridges to Safety Victim Service Center. All of those you'll hear a little bit more about in just a few moments. One of the great things was just shortening the number of days that it took between the time an abuse act occurred and the time that the perpetrator was charged. This dramatically reduces the likelihood, dramatically increases the likelihood of a conviction in these instances. 
The collaboration sends a message. It sends a message that we are united as a community to deal with the issue of domestic abuse. It sends a message to perpetrators that if you act, you will be caught, you will be prosecuted, and you will be convicted. And hopefully, it sends a message to the victims of domestic abuse that we will stand with you, that we will do everything that we can to ensure your safety and the safety of your children, and we will do everything to make sure that it never happens again. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Gruing, our city attorney, who has made this a priority issue for her in her tenure. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being here this morning. As the mayor said, I, my name is Sarah Gruing, and I am five weeks into my tenure as city attorney. So uh, words cannot express how grateful I am to all of you who have uh, continued my education on this issue. And I, look so, I so look forward to working with all of you. Um, as the mayor said, this partnership is, is, the partners in this effort are almost too numerous to mention, but know that we are so grateful to all of you from the direct service providers, to the police officers, to the prosecutors, to the advocates who work on this issue every day, especially during this month of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We want to really uh, honor and thank you for the work that you do on this issue. Uh, personally, I also want to thank my predecessor, John Choi, who's here today. Um, he is a friend and mentor in so many ways, but especially um, uh, in this innovative approach to public safety and domestic violence issues. So thank you very much, John. We know you have a busy week. Uh, thank you for being here today. We really appreciate it. As so many of you know, uh, when a person is a, a, a victim of domestic violence, every second of every moment of every day is the difference between safety and danger. And so I am just so, again, incredibly proud of the things that we've done here uh, in St. Paul to shorten the time uh, that it takes for uh, these charges to go out and to uh, honor the dignity of these victims and treat them as, as human beings and not just another statistic like any other crime in the city. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about the three kind of the three-legged stool uh, uh, approach to the things that we've worked on here in St. Paul and then I'm going to turn it over to Chief Smith to to talk about the police response. But um, our collaborative approach here, as I said, has three main components, as many of you know and work on. Uh, the Flare Up Project, Bridges to Safety, and the Blueprint for Safety. Uh, I'll briefly address each one, uh, and, and uh, we can talk about that more in depth as need be. Uh, the Flare Up Project is a cross-disciplinary team of police, advocates, prosecutors, and probation. Funded in part by the Office of Violence Against Women, the Flare Up team meets every day to review all domestic crime reports. The team comprises of an advocate, police, officers, and a prosecutor does two things. They flag all highly lethal and repeat offenders, um, and then they uh, review those cases where the suspect was gone on arrival, as the mayor said. And we found, through working with all of you, the advocates and, and uh, public safety partners, that these were our most lethal and most dangerous cases. Um, it, at the time, when we started this, it was taking an average of 80 days for those gone on arrival cases to be charged. I'm proud to announce that as of August of this year, uh, we've reduced the number of days in that case to eight. Um, Again, you all know time is of the essence in these cases. So uh, especially in the case where these are the, some of our most lethal offenders, the fact that we could shorten that window and get these victims on a path to safety is really uh, key. Uh, so that's the flare-up grant that we're very proud of. And then, of course, we also have Bridges to Safety, as so many of you are familiar. Uh, it's a grassroots, multidisciplined victim service center that assists victims of domestic violence and their children. It was created and is operated by the Partnership for Domestic Abuse Services, a collaborative of over 20 St. Paul and Ramsey County community-based and government agencies. Bridges to Safety, located right in the St. Paul and Ramsey County Courthouse, ensures that victims of domestic abuse, including their children, have access to culturally relevant services and support from community-based agencies. Uh, the objective is to make sure that they have support from the criminal and civil justice systems, court services, legal aid, community-based programs, and social service providers. Its partners believe that all victims of domestic violence should have safe access to protection and confidential services, be treated with dignity, and always acknowledged for being the experts on their own lives and their own public safety. 
I was speaking with one of our prosecutors yesterday, and she talked about it as a place uh, where healing can truly begin. That this is a that this is a place of peace and of honor, um, and that we can get them on the right path. So I'm so proud of that work as well. Since June of 2008, over 3,400 vi- victims of domestic abuse have received over 5,100 individual critical services at Bridges, and over 75 percent of these participants receive ongoing services from these partnering agencies. The Partnership for Domestic Abuse Services through its creation and continued collaborative operation of Bridges to Safety has proven that in joining together physically as well as philosophically, diverse victim service providers can significantly improve the array and quality of services that are safely accessible to all victims of domestic violence. So that's Bridges and we're so proud of that one too. And finally, of course, the, the third leg to that stool, of course, is the, the, the St. Paul Blueprint for Safety. Uh, and I think even before I started uh, my tenure as uh, St. Paul City Attorney, I was already meeting with folks on the blueprint and how it's this living document that we can continue to improve on. But it is the result of the rich and productive community and government alliances within the city and Ramsey County. The best practices originated by numerous battered women's and domestic violence programs and jurisdictions throughout Minnesota and the vision and direction of experts from the field of domestic abuse. We pursued this momentous project out of the recognition that when systems do not utilize sound intervention approaches or coordinate on multiple levels of information gathering and sharing, fatal injuries and tragedies will occur. One of the St. Paul Blueprint's greatest contributions is in its meticulous attention to the details of interagency case processing in guiding our criminal justice system's response to domestic violence from 911 to final case disposition. Again, in speaking with our prosecutors on this, they talk about how it's a whole new world open to them um, from the information you get from that 911 call. It, you see the case in more of a continuum and not just the charging document that hits your desks. Uh, The St. Paul Blueprint for Safety is the result of a collaborative effort to gather in one document a set of plans and best practices that will increase the criminal justice system's accessibility, accountability services, and protections for all victims of domestic abuse. It has been a model in the creation of the general blueprint for safety designed to help jurisdictions across the state develop and implement a response to domestic violence that is tailored to the unique needs and resources of our own community, of their own community, excuse me. In short, the St. Paul Blueprint will both inspire and enhance the way criminal justice systems across the country respond to victims of domestic violence. Again, thank you, all of you on Blueprint for Safety. One of the reasons we've gathered here today, besides to thank and honor all of you during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, is to officially recommit our new public safety administrations, both mine and Chief Smith's, to ending family violence in this community. But of course, Chief Smith's record is no, uh, not news to any of you. Uh, so I'll turn it over to him to talk about the work his department is on this issue. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your work. So many smiley faces, so many good partners, so many good friends in this room, I want to say Real quick, uniqueness, compassion, and partnerships. That's what combating domestic violence is all about. We keep giving each other a round of applause, but I'm going to give you a round of applause for all of our partners in here. There's some specific people I want to mention just within my own department that have just been on this journey together to make our city and our families safer. Number one, Amy Brown. Amy Brown was uh, one of our keys working on our blueprint for safety process. She's done a fantastic job. And Nancy DePerna hiding behind that other camera. Come on, Nancy, get in front here. Thank you. You know, on our St. Paul Police business cards, our mantra is professionalism, pride, and partnerships. Partnerships truly is what we are here for today because we work together. When we talk about what the St. Paul Police Department has done dealing with domestic violence, we've learned kind of a new way of doing business. We've learned that our officers have more resources now than they did just two years ago. They have partners. They had advocates that they go out with in the street with our flare-up grant. They have places that they can bring people to that are safe. When you talk about bridges of safety, I wanted, I wanted to do one other thing here, or excuse me, uh, kind of express what bridges does. If you are a mother and a victim of domestic violence, it's very difficult to trust somebody. 
because this is there, it, there's a control measure. Our officers, in partnership with the Bridges to Safety, our city partners, our county partners, our advocates, St. Paul Intervention, so many great people. A mother can go down there with her children and not only have somebody to listen to her, but also have child care for her family, have compassion, find other resources. Now those resources might mean they have to call the St. Paul Police Department again because now they have a trusting relationship with our investigators and our officers to know that domestic abuse will not be tolerated. That is so important, my friends. I'm very passionate about this issue. I know what it's like to see um, the end result of domestic abuse, and it's very difficult. Our officers now, we talked about the GOA cases. GOA means gone on arrival. 70% of the time, perpetrators are gone. They're smart. I'm not going to stay here. Someone's calling 911. But now those cases are being charged very, very quickly. And not only that, again, we have the resources for the victims to follow through. They have that compassionate ear. The officers ask different questions now. That's been part of our training. We call it lethality questions. What are the key questions that prosecutors need, whether it's at the city or county attorney's office, to help hold people accountable? That's the key here, holding people accountable. And that is working unbelievably well. So I want to I want to tell you that from the St. Paul Police Department perspective, if I could just bottle this all up into one word, I would talk about the partnerships because I realize how important it is for our officers to be able to work with St. Paul Intervention, how important it is to be able to work with the city attorney's office. I mean, domestic blueprint for safety process is from A to Z. We start with the first call to the emergency communication center, go all the way through the criminal justice system, all the way to probation and we're all working together. This is a first, this is a national model, and thanks to the leadership of our mayor and others in this room, we are gonna continue this effort. I wanna thank you for being here today. This is something we should all always be passionate about, and I know right now our families, we have mothers that are much safer in our city because of all of your work, thank you. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but each of us knows that every single day, hundreds, of women and children are terrorized in their homes by someone that is supposed to love and care for them. We know that domestic violence does not discriminate. It occurs in all races, religions, cultures, socioeconomic statuses, and neighborhoods. The epidemic affects each of us in multiple ways. As advocates, we are united, building partnerships necessary to address the specific needs of victims and their children as we do with police officers, by bringing individualized services to victims directly after a domestic crime happens in St. Paul. We are present as advocates. So victims are not alone when navigating through the criminal justice system, so they understand the process and know what to expect. We offer emotional support while victims give a police report. We listen emphatically so we can assist in communicating with prosecutors, legal assistants, victim witness advocates, and other arms of the system on their behalf. We act as a cultural and linguistically diverse conduit to accessing help. We give moral support when they testify or face their abusers. We provide support and assistance in securing shelter, financial help, food, clothing, medical attention, counseling, and transitional services. We make connections so victims can access individualized safety options by obtaining orders for protections or seamlessly relocate to safe housing. We help seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We speak to ensure victims' voices are heard in every possible way so that collectively and united, we respond to these issues not as silent bystanders, rather as accountable community members that will not condone domestic violence. The collaborations highlighted a moment ago and all the supporters here today know that when we unite, victims can be safe. We know that a victim cannot do it alone. The police cannot do it alone. Advocates cannot do it alone. Entire criminal justice systems, spiritual groups, businesses, victim service centers, and foundations cannot do it alone. Our collaborations through St. Paul and Ramsey County know there is power in our numbers that working together 
breaks down the barriers victims face in accessing safety. And as a community, we are saying to all victims that when you're ready, we are here. Shortly, you will hear from a woman whose life directly benefited from each one of our collaborations. As you listen to her story, I hope you will envision the flare-up team who already had her perpetrator red flagged within the system, our Bridges to Safety partners who work to keep her safe, and practices within the blueprint that delineate best practices for a coordinated systems response, and all of our funders, community agencies, and businesses whose support had enabled us to help her. I know that when she speaks today, we will not be viewing her as a victim or the face of a survivor, but as our teacher. We will see her courage for having the ability to stand up here and address this crowd, her poise as she shares some of the most intimate details of her life, her strength as she chronicles horrific incidences of all forms of abuse she has suffered, her power that she has fought so hard to regain, and her bravery and having faith in us as advocates, police, prosecutors, judges, lawyers, medical professionals, and a community to make it safe for her to reach out and ask for our help. It is because of women like her that advocates like me come to work every single day. It is with my greatest honor to welcome Miss Kelly up here to once again trust each of us and share her story. Um, I just wanted to say I'm very honored to be here today and speak my story. So, um, I fell in love with my boyfriend when I was 20 years old. For two years, we were very happy, and he treated me wonderfully. Um, he would tell me that he enjoyed being with me, that he was really, s that I was really special, and that he loved me. There were many times that it seemed almost too good to be true. Uh, we moved in together. My boyfriend made more money than I did, and wanted to pay for everything. He would always buy me gifts, even though I didn't ask him to. I began to notice that he was acting differently when he would buy me things, as if I owed him something. <clears throat> One night, we were driving. I didn't put the turn signal all the way down, and he snapped. He grabbed me and screamed that I was stupid and did everything wrong. Um, I was shocked and felt devastated. I called my dad, who came and picked me up. Um, I was so upset that he called the police, and they came and got me and brought me to the hospital. A month later, I found out I was pregnant. My boyfriend and I talked on the phone, and we were both very excited about the baby. I still stayed with my parents, but things with my boyfriend began to feel good again. <clears throat> a month and a half later, when I was out, I started cramping and felt a terrible pain. I went to the hospital and learned that I was miscarrying. I called my boyfriend to tell him what was happening and that I was scared. His only response was that he didn't think he could make it to the hospital, but that he still loved me. <clears throat> my parents came with me to the hospital. He never showed up. When I returned home, my boyfriend called. He was screaming that he knew what I did. I was worthless and had let him down. He accused me of having an abortion, that I killed my baby. I told him I did not want to see or talk to him. Um, over the next few weeks, I became very depressed and started drinking. I felt I somehow needed to make it up to him and convince him to forgive me for losing our baby. I tried being around other people, but I always felt lost. I didn't know who I was anymore. I was suicidal and believed that no one would ever want, want to be with me. When I received the paperwork from the hospital, I gave it to him to prove that I did not abort my baby. I felt grateful when he wanted to get back together with me. A month and a half later, we moved in together. Uh, one night, he began to gently ask me if I had saw anyone when we were broken up. I told him that I did date a little, but that we were not together at the time. He suddenly started screaming and throwing things. <clears throat> he slammed my head into the arm of a chair and shoved me into the wall. He kept yelling terrible things that I couldn't even carry his baby and that I cheated on him while we were broken up. He hit me hard on the side of my head, causing me to lose my hearing. Um, he started a slice of all the furniture with a knife. And then he made me pack his things, put them in the car, and he left. <clears throat> I moved back home, and kept calling. he kept calling me on my cell phone and texting me very demeaning messages. 
He accused me of doing awful things and typed out every single mistake that I'd ever made. Even though we had been apart for five and a half months, I still felt bad and thought that everything was my fault. I was convinced that I had done bad things to him or that he wouldn't be so angry. He told me that no one else had made him feel this horrible and I was the cause of all his anger. I even wrote to him to apologize. <clears throat> I became consumed with how he was feeling and his well-being. I somehow believed that I deserved everything that he did. One day he contacted me and we secretly started to see each other again. Um, he started telling me that he was upset because my family and friends were always saying cruel things about me behind my back and that none of them even cared about me. I, came, I became more isolated. Um, he constantly reminded me that no one ever wanted me and I began to feel that he was the only one that would stand by me. I moved out of my parents' house and my boyfriend moved in with me. I thought that this was as good as, as it was gonna get. <clears throat> we had been living together for about three months with his toddler son from a previous relationship who stayed with us often. One morning we started to argue. He kept telling me that I was cheap and had been with other men. I left and walked up to the store. When I returned, I told him I could no longer live this way. Um, he just, he snapped and he picked up an iron and hit me in the face. I could hear his son screaming and crying while he continued, continued to beat me. He hit me in the face over and over again, stomped on me with both of his feet, kept spitting on me and repetitively strangling me until I almost passed out. I tried to make it to the door with a knife that I had kept hidden under my mattress because of my fear of him, but he grabbed the knife and put it in my ear. He kept saying over and over again that I was going to die today, that I was never gonna see my mom again. Um, he finally removed the knife from my ear and continued to beat me. He raped me twice, once in front of his son. Then he made me stand in the closet for over an hour while he whipped me with his belt. For over five hours, he dragged me from room to room, viciously beating me while his son watched. Suddenly, he finally stopped and made me take a shower while he watched the entire time. <clears throat> he told me to put on makeup to cover my cuts and bruises, pants, a turtleneck, and a jacket. Then he ordered me to get his son dressed and made us both get into the car. I felt numb and terrified and kept thinking over and over, how am I gonna escape? We drove to his cousin's house where some of his relatives were. I sat on the couch feeling numb and was afraid to look up. When my boyfriend went to the bathroom, an older woman sat next to me and asked me if there was something that she could do. My boyfriend came charging into the room, yelling that he had beat me and that I was, he was gonna do it again here in front of everyone and that anyone who tried to stop him didn't stand a chance. No one did anything when he forced me and his son back into the car. I was hysterical and begged him to, to not take me back to the house and try to jump out of the car, but he stopped me. He forced me back into the house, took me into the bathroom, and began to run a bath. He made me take off my clothes. It hurt, it hurt so bad to take my pants off because my legs were so swollen. In the tub, I couldn't stop crying. My eardrum popped underneath the water and lacerations on my body burned and were bleeding. When I was out of the bath, he made me go out again. We went to his friend's house and later inside the house, he started pushing me and screaming that I was a whore and that no, nobody wanted to be with me. No one in the house would help me. Everyone was afraid of him. I tried not to leave with him, but he forced me back into the car and drove back to the house. He dragged me into the bedroom and straddled me on top of the bed. He kept spitting in my face and made me sign a note saying that I owed him $5,000 for the trouble that I caused him. I could not stop shaking and crying. He made me lay down by him on the bed and he told me that if I moved that I would pay. I laid there for hours not moving and staring up at the ceiling. He was sleeping next to me. Um, the sun was barely up when I slowly slid out of bed 
picked up my purse and a towel off the floor to cover it and snuck out of the bedroom. I pulled on a big sweatshirt I found in the hallway, tiptoed into the bathroom, turned on the shower, and then snuck out the back door. I ran for five blocks before I saw anyone. A woman was unlocking her office and I ran towards her. When she pulled me into her building, she called 911. She stayed with me for a while, well, the entire time while I was waiting for the police. She was really kind and definitely worried about me. When the police arrived, they sat with me and asked me what had happened. They too were really kind and took everything very seriously. When I got into the police car, I saw my boyfriend's picture on the monitor. They took me back to my house. When we arrived there, there were squad cars and officers surrounding the house. I told the officers that my boyfriend's son was in the house and they assured me that he would be okay. One of the officers called the family violence unit and an officer and a St. Paul interven intervention advocate came. I was alone in the police car when I saw my boyfriend taken out in handcuffs. I felt paralyzed, but the officers reassured me that I would be all right if I got out of the car. The advocate and officer Mike arrived. I don't know why, but as soon as the advocate started talking to me, I felt this sudden peace of mind. My advocate told me that her name was Bree, that I would be all right, and she promised that she would help me get through this. <clears throat> Bree stayed with me while the police were gathering evidence at my house and when the officers took pictures of my injuries and took my statement. Bree called the hospital and asked to speak to the nurse in charge. She briefly explained what had happened and asked that a room and a rape examination kit be ready for me when I arrived. She told me what um, the hospital would do when we got there and why. Mike was very nice and I found it comforting that he wasn't in his uniform. <laughs> Mike drove us to the hospital and we went right to the ER through the back door. Bree asked the administration if they would wait to speak to me and that we could do the paper, paperwork at the same time that the SANE nurse asked questions and after my examination. She stayed with me and held my hand while Mike took pictures and a follow-up statement. An advocate from SOS arrived and Bree explained to me that her role and what to expect during the exam. Even though I was throbbing with pain and it was hard to answer the questions, I felt safe with Bree and Mike there. For the first time in a long time, I wasn't alone. After the hospital, I stayed at my parents' house. <clears throat> the next morning, I was brought to the St. Paul Intervention Project, where Bree helped me fill out the paperwork for an order for protection, develop a safety plan, and talk about how I was feeling. A few days later, my house had been broken into. Most of my things were either destroyed or stolen. It appeared to the police that someone who knew my boyfriend had done it. We felt I wouldn't be safe at my parents' house that evening, so Bree helped me get into a battered women's shelter. I stayed one night at the shelter. The people there treated me well, realized what I had been through, and understood that I would only be staying for that one night. My advocate, Bree, helped me into um, the support groups, worked with state reparations to help pay for medical costs, and stayed with me when the police and prosecutor needed to meet. She took my order of protection down to the Bridges to Safety where the staff at the domestic abuse office filed it. Then she met with the lawyer from Smurls to get advice about my lease. After reviewing the lease, the lawyer described in detail how and when I could terminate the lease, enabling me to remove my things when it was safe to do so. Um, the prosecutor who was handling the case made me feel very comfortable. He was really easy to talk to. Throughout the entire criminal process, my advocate explained to me and my parents what was going on, who, and, who was doing what and why, and at each interval, what the possible outcomes could be. Before the court hearing, my family and I would meet Bree at her office at Bridges to Safety. We felt relaxed and safe there and were able to keep away from my boyfriend's family at the time of the trial. When it was time for me to testify in court, I looked directly at my boyfriend. At first, he gave me intimidating looks, but I kept looking at him straight in the eye and began to tell the court what he had done to me. Whenever I looked out into the courtroom, I could see my advocate, Bree, sitting with my family, smiling at me and urging me on. I knew that right outside the chamber doors, there were police officers, the woman who helped me, and my landlord. 
I also thought of all the other people who had helped me, the shelter, legal aid lawyer, nurses and doctors, and so many others. It was all these people who believed in me that gave me so much strength. And even though I was really nervous, I felt calm, for I was able to speak what was on my mind and what had been going on for the very, very first time. My boyfriend no longer stared at me when I was testifying. He looked down at the table. He pled guilty the next day. Um, the judge noted to the court and my boyfriend that only after a long testimony did he plead guilty. And that after all that he had put me through, he should not have waited. When I walked out of the courtroom, I could not believe all the people who were there to hear the outcome. I remember hugging my advocate, the police officers, the prosecutor, the woman from the shop, and my family. So many people had made me feel so alive again. Later, my boyfriend was sentenced to nine years. Bree helped me write my victim impact statement and was with me when I read it. Um, when I was done, the judge commended me on my strength and courage to go forward. He also recognized how difficult it must have been knowing that my abuser was waiting for, for me to become scared and afraid to go on. Now I'm working, I have my own place, and I'm about to start nursing school. <laughs> Um, although I still find it very difficult to trust people and it haunts me every day what happened, I know that I'm strong, I'm who I'm supposed to be, and I'm capable of doing anything. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I know that none of you know me um, but you've all helped me very much, and I don't know what I would have done without each and every one of you. Um, I don't think that I could have made it, and I don't even know if I would be alive today, so thank you. All of us are in this together. All of us are here to support Kelly and so many, too many women like her, too many people that have suffered this. The courage, Kelly, for you to tell your story, but that story has to be told, unfortunately. But we're so thankful. We're so thankful to all of you. Domestic Abuse Violence Awareness Month it needs to be Domestic Abuse Violence Awareness Year and decade until we end the scourge of domestic violence. Thank you for sharing us. Thank all of you for being supporters of this. Thank you. Thank you.